Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Smigelski, and uh, we're lucky today to have Dr. Sami El Samra. Um, Dr. El Samra is an assistant professor of urology at Brown and previously completed, I believe, an endo urology fellowship. Um, and also, I believe, was previously program director at uh, Robert Wood Johnson. Um, so, thank you for being here with us today, Dr. El Samra. Um, wanted to ask you. Um, you know, how did you end up deciding to get involved with being a program director? Um, and what's some advice for uh, residents who may be interested in, you know, more of an educator type role, um, if you have any? Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, educating is one of the key privileges uh, that we have uh, in this field. Um, there are few things that are more rewarding than, you know, uh, walking a resident or a medical student through a new a technique or a new topic and having them pick it up and having that close relationship, I think with uh, residents is what I found to be very attractive uh, towards, uh, you know, towards going down that path. And yeah, definitely. Um, and then when you, you know, I think a lot of people feel like they want to commit to one institution forever and stay there. Um, any advice about you know, uh, recognizing that it might be time to switch institutions or, um, you know, I, I think that can be a stressful thing for a lot of uh, physicians and having done that yourself, any lessons learned that you could impart? It's very, that could be, that could be the topic of a whole nother lecture series. Um, uh, just a plug for young urologist committee that they, they come out with a uh, transition manual uh, every year. Um, so I recommend all the residents uh, uh, look it up. It's not in this version, but I, I put something together for the next version to cover that very topic. So, All right. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm sure we're all, I certainly, but I'm sure everybody is very excited to hear this talk. So um, thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, I have to give credit to uh, one of my chief residents at Brown who helped me come up with the title. So uh, I've, I've been meaning to give this talk for a while and I'm really fortunate that uh, uh, the Empire Lecture Series has given me the opportunity to give this talk. Thank you to all the organizers and to the New York section. I do have some disclosures as listed up here. There, none of them are related to this topic. I also have a disclaimer. Um, a lot of the content that I've taken uh, is out of the White Coat Investor, and it's, uh, he's an emergency medicine physician, Jim Dolly. He's got his own website, blog, podcast, a couple of books. I, I mean, really the guy is a force in uh, personal finance for physicians, and I advise that you, you look him up. But this presentation is considered general advice. It's for your information entertainment only. It's not formal financial accounting or legal advice. You need to verify this information with a reputable, reputable source. I'm not a financial advisor, and I don't have any formal training in personal finance. What, it, what my formal training is in is in urology and minimally invasive urology. So I did, you know, um, much like everyone else who's listening, four years of college. I did four years of medical school, in the middle of which I, I did a year of research as part of a foiled attempt at an MD-PhD. I did a five-year residency and then two years of fellowship. And at the end of that, you know, I, I was uh, pretty competent at doing robotic surgeries. I, get, I take out difficult prostates. Uh, I do intracorporeal urinary diversions. I do some complex partial nephrectomies. And I was more than happy to talk uh, about any one of those things. But they said, no, no, please give a talk on finances. So uh, at the end of that time, while I mastered all those clinical um, uh, special or clinical entities, I came out of it also having deferred and forbeared my loans for seven years since graduating medical school, having a lot of debt. I had no savings. And in fact, I, I had to borrow some money from family just to be able to start my new job and uh, assume the cost of starting life after residency and fellowship. Finally, I had an attending salary and it was such a much needed in uh, injection of cash. I felt like I was, you know, finally, I finally made it and I had all this money to throw around. But if you look closely at the pictures, they're all single dollar bills. 
And those single Daravilles had a lot of places that it needed to go. And so I lived the lifestyle creep and hedonic adaptation. And these are, you know, the, uh, these are actual terms that are used to describe the phenomenon where you get a raise, you have more money, you spend more money, you run out of it, you work harder, and you just, you're on this treadmill uh, that basically never ends. And in fact, every time, you know, I felt like I got more money, it would vanish without any appreciable increase in, in my quality of life. So I figured education is key and I started reading. Um, this wasn't all at once, you know, I, you know, I read a couple of books early on and I started doing some little things little by little and then I increased. But uh, here's a list of the books that I've read uh, so far, uh, at least most of the book. And then, um, you know, two of these books uh, I want to highlight, they are free and available for you online legally. Um, uh, one of them is If You Can by William Bernstein, and I, I'd highly recommend that you go out there. It's like a 16-page PDF, uh, very important to read, and it lists a whole lot of these books as references for further reading. And then Medical Student Loans for those by Ben White. If, for those of you that have student loans, I would really suggest that you go on there. I think in exchange for your email, uh, you're able to get this book in PDF or in uh, Kindle format. Um, in addition to all these books, I, I've listened to hundreds of hours of podcasts on, on personal finance, and really recently it's become a, a point of interest for me. Uh, you know, no, no urology talk is complete without a paper citation and, uh, and a, uh, a clipping of the header of the paper. So, you know, uh, this was a, a paper that was uh, cited um, in 2010. It was oft cited, and it basically said that all you need is a salary of 75,000 to be happy, and that's in 2010 dollars. So probably it's closer to 100,000 now. It's based on a Gallup World poll, uh, almost two million individuals, and basically they found that 95,000 was needed for life evaluation. That means when you look back on your life, you say, yeah, you know, I accomplished some things. I'm pretty happy with what I've accomplished, but you only need a 75,000 for emotional well-being. And in some parts of the world, income above satiation was associated with lower life evaluations. And they, they graphed it out and you can see here, you know, mean life evaluation versus your income. In all these countries and uh, North America, or, uh, regions of the world, I should say, North America is up here. You can see that there's a significant increase, but then it tapers off. And uh, that's true for the positive effect and also for the uh, negative effect. Now, the reason why that is because money is important for meeting basic needs, purchasing stuff, loan repayments, et cetera. But after an optimal point, people tend to be driven by desires such as pursuing more material gains and engaging in social comparisons, which could ironically lower your well being. If you're always trying to keep up with the Joneses, you're never going to win. And you know this point is highlighted by the cartoon here. I'm sorry it's a little grainy, but as you can see, not only have we kept up with the Joneses and surpassed them, next up the Nelsons. So it's a it's a never-ending um, chase if that's what you're uh, going to make your goal. So don't make your satisfaction contingent on other people's status. You know, do you live your life? Take what is necessary for you know for your life satisfaction. And try to avoid looking at you know, social media for comparisons. Hey, how am I doing compared to everybody else? So with that introduction, we do wanna go over financial literacy, immediate financial priorities for residents, stone, uh, student loan management for residents, disability insurance, term life insurance. I combined that section actually. Roth retirement accounts, a written financial plan and contract evaluation. So financial literacy, you know, Residency and medical school has made you a clinical expert. And you could go out there and do a TERP or do a sling or whatever you were trained to do and what you're going to do, you're gonna be an expert at that. But unfortunately our residencies and our medical education in general is not set up for any business training or personal finance training. Uh, and you're thrust into this role of being your pension fund manager in a 401k world. You're the CFO of your family and it doesn't come automatically. So you have to do some reading and you have to 
uh, spend time learning about finances and businesses. You have to think about it. You can't win the game if you don't learn the rules. If you don't have time to do it, hire a professional. But even then, a lot of professionals have baked in conflicts of interest. Uh, they, even though they may be fiduciary responsive, they may have a fiduciary responsibility. That's hard to prove. And oftentimes knowing it and holding them to task is better than just, you know, throwing your money in their hands and letting them be. You cannot be 100% clinical and financially successful. It's just not going to work. So there's an initial financial education. And uh, this is, you know, actually the White Coat Investor uh, recommends these four books, Personal Finance uh, for Dummies, um, The Boggleheads Guide to Investing. I think that's one of my books next up. How to Think About Money by Jonathan Clements. It's a great book. Uh, I think he's a great author. He was an editor of the Wall Street Journal for many years. And then The White Coat Investor is a really good how-to guide. The second one, Financial Boot Camp, is really structured uh, with... Uh, a lot of the to-dos that you have to think about when, you, uh, when you're a medical student resident or even beyond. And you need to put a, a written financial uh, plan in place. After that, you gotta keep reading. So read one more good book uh, every year, follow a financial blog, listen to a podcast, do something, but it's gotta be part of your ongoing responsibilities, kind of like CME, but for your own financial household. So what are your immediate financial priorities? One, you have to live below your means. You know, uh, it's very difficult uh, to resist the urge to just spend all the money that you have. You just shouldn't do it. And you should write down a budget, track your expenditures and adjust as necessary. When you have a budget, you're telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went at the end of the month. But in that budget, you know, there's, you know, and Warren Buffett has this quote, I have it up on the slide, don't save what is left after spending, spend what is left after saving. And honestly, that's uh, also iterated in a principle known as pay yourself first. So you should honestly work in a strategy where you save first and then spend what is left after savings. You also need to have an emergency fund. Uh, you need to, if you have nothing, at all right now, start out with like $1,000. You don't want a clogged toilet or, you know, a flat tire or some sort of mechanical breakdown in your car or something to put you in a lurch. I mean, it, you know, if you have no cash flow and you don't have an emergency fund, you really could be in a bind and then you'll be asking for loans. And it's just not ideal. So let's start out with $1,000 if nothing else. And then the goal is to have three to six months of expenses. The interesting thing is with Corona, a lot of physicians have uh, suffered pay cuts or even been furloughed uh, for part of their job, if not all of their job. And that, who would have thought that during a health pandemic, a viral pandemic, that physicians would lose their money. And so it's important to be able to weather a storm and have an emergency fund. If you have high interest credit cards, pay them off stat. That's just bad news. 24% interest is not where you want to go. And Elizabeth Warren has this pretty good rule. I, I think it's a good uh, general rule of thumb, which is 50, 30, 20. So 50% of your spending should go on needs, 30% on wants, 20% on savings. And it's just really important, again, to highlight that if you are purposeful about your spending, you will have money left over. Whereas if you're not purposeful, you'll wonder where it went. And so it's important to have a budget. Uh, as of this morning, there are 29 responses. I guess this one was uh, right before the 29th response. But how many of you had a written budget and uh, the majority used a mental budget? So I would say, you know, there's room for improvement here. You guys could work on getting a budget together. And there are services online like Mint or NerdWallet to help you do this if you don't wanna do it on an Excel spreadsheet. But Dr. Sammy, my residency is in, a, is in an expensive city. You know, I gotta I got pay like $3,000 a month, you know, or 2,500 a month to, to just live, you know, just have a roof over my head. Well, you know, this is something I hear all the time you don't get a pass on math because you happen to live in an expensive city. And so there are options, you know, you can commute, you could get a roommate, 
get a subsidy for mom and dad, whatever you have to do, but just try not to burden yourself with that kind of expense. So, and I was surprised that in our response, our, our um, thank you, to everybody who filled out the response, by the way, how comfortable are you on your resident salary? And it seems like there's a good bell distribution with the majority of people who are, seem to be okay. They're not, they're not doing great, but they're okay. So here's a sample budget. Very simple. I just did this on Excel. You know, the, I think the PGY2 um, salary at Robert Wood Johnson is $64,000 and some change. So right off the bat, take 15%. You know, 15% off the bat, it gives you 9,600. Put a little bit into your emergency fund, put the rest, you know, up to $6,000 a month into an IRA. I'm sorry, 6,000 a year into an IRA. And, uh, and then calculate your budget from there. So housing should be around 30%, no more than 30%. Food is probably gonna be around 10, 15% as is transportation, taxes you need to take out of there, health, insurance, recreation, giving, all that kind of stuff. And you could adjust this as you go along. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. So I encourage everybody to transition from a mental budget to an actual written budget. Student loan management. Student loan burdens worsen. I mean, in 1999, the mean debt was 122,000. That's in, adjusted for inflation. In 2018, it was 250,000 for DOs, 200,000 for MDs. And that means half of them have more than that amount of debt. Uh, 300 uh, to 450,000 is becoming more common. Governments won't refinance them when rates fall and uh, current resident loan interest rates, they, they range anywhere from 5.4 to 10%. So again, thank you to everybody who filled out the surveys. The vast majority of you guys have student loans. The amount of the student loans is pretty impressive actually. You know, if you look at the two largest categories, uh, purple is 200,000 and the blue is gray and 250,000, you know, vast majority of you guys have sub some substantial loans. And what is the aggregate interest? Uh, I'm very glad that nobody selected don't know. That would have been bad. But uh, the interest rates are like 6.1 to 9%. Uh, that's, that's a lot for the majority of you guys. Um, and how much is your student loan burden concerning you? It seems like uh, for... Uh, for half of you guys, very much. Uh, for the rest of you guys, you know, it's gradations. So how bad can it be? Monthly payments on 400,000 at 7.5% are gonna be roughly 5,000 a month for 10 years. That's a lot of money. If your gross income is 210K, your net income after taxes and health insurance and all that, 161K, so you're talking about a third, over a third of your net income. And that, that's only getting worse. Uh, I put down here the rule of 72. The rule of 72 is if you take 72 and you divide it by your interest rate, that'll give you an approximation for how long it'll take for your, um, for your loans to double in size. And so uh, if you take a, uh, a uh, $400,000 at 7.5%, that's basically going to double to 800,000 in 10 years. So there are all these programs from the government uh, that are uh, here to help. They're, they're all income contingent repayment plans. So ICR is actually the main category. And under ICR, there's the income based, there's the pay as you earn, there's the revised pay as you earn, there's the public service loan forgiveness. And if you have federal loans, you need to become an expert or hire an expert on these programs. Now these programs, this is a table here that shows you the poverty line based on number of people. Uh, it's, a it's a definition put out by the US government. These payment plans, income-based repayment plans, are based off, of, they don't want you going into poverty or even into 150% of poverty. Imagine living on $17,000. So just be thankful that we're not in poverty. Um, and then you take your salary and you subtract uh, that from the 150% percentile, and then you get your basically your uh, payments that way. 
So the income driven repayment programs have nothing to do with interest rate. They have nothing to do with debt burden. They're based solely on the income and number of people in your family. So here's the income based repayment. It's, uh, it's technically under the ICR. So it's lower payments, more hardship features. It's the only income plan that's allowed if you have FFEL loans instead of direct loans. And I, I think those are, those are probably much older loans right now. They're probably loans from my generation. Um, payments are 15% of discretionary income with a maximum of uh, regular payments uh, on a 10 year plan. Now, let's say you have an exorbitant amount of, of loans, uh, which is kind of hard to do because uh, there's a cap on the loans that you could get from the federal government. But nonetheless, uh, let's say you're on this and you have six people in your family and you, know, you work for the VA, you don't make much money. And so it is possible that by just doing the minimum for 25 years, the rest of uh, the, the, in, uh, the uh, loans are not uh, satisfied. And if that is the case, they are forgiven at 25 years. However, that forgiveness is taxable. Uh, the good news is if you're on the income-based repayment plan, the payments count towards the public service loan forgiveness. Pay as you earn is a new and better income-based repayment plan. It's not eligible for if loans are pre-2007 or if loans after 2011, you must use IBR um, instead. There are 10% of discretionary income, 10-year plan, and there's taxable forgiveness after 20 years. Uh, payments count uh, towards PSLF. There's a uh, revised pay as you earn, uh, which is a similar thing. 10 years of discretionary income without a maximum, Taxable forgiveness after 25 years of payments, 20 for undergrad loans. I think the pay does not cover undergrad loans. Payments count towards PSLF. The interest is subsidized during residency. And so that is a huge benefit. And I, you know, I would advise you guys to, if you have federal loans uh, to be on repay, um, higher payments after residency. Now, one thing I want to add is that during this corona, I think there are all these uh, Acts that came out, I believe it was part of the Care, CARES Act. Uh, all these uh, financial, um, federal financial loans have gone on to like 0% and no payments required, which is great. Uh, so if you can afford it, continue to pay them off because that's going to decrease from your principal. Uh, but if you have better things to do with your money, then that's fine. PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness. So you have to be in a qualifying program income-based re, uh, repayment, pay as you earn, repay. You have to have 120 on-time payments while working full-time for a 501c3. So most residencies fall under a 501c3, um, as, as do fellowships. Your job is where that can get tricky. So if you're relying on PSLF, that kind of limits your job options. You can't go and open up your own for-profit private practice or join a private group you have to be part of a 501c3. And what's, what's interesting is that many doctors working in nonprofit hospitals are not employees of 501c3. So, so, you, so the private practitioner who comes in to your university hospital while he contracts for the university hospital or he happens to uh, service his patients there, the university hospital doesn't give him his salary and so his salary uh, is, does not qualify. So you have to be careful um, and that, that'd be, you know, it, there are many instances where that's the case. You know, if, you, if you're contracted for the VA, let's say you're, you're contracted for the VA and you're paid by a private practice group, you're, you will not qualify for uh, the public service loan forgiveness. So it kind of limits your jobs. You have to be aware of that. This is uh, particularly true, I think, for like big mega groups like anesthesia groups and, and um, uh, large urology group practices, those kinds of groups that service these places. So uh, the one thing about PSLF is um, it's great for urology because urology training is pretty long. A lot of folks are going into fellowship. So if you're five years a resident and then two years a fellow, so that's seven years. If you're doing, you know, a repay program, for instance, your interest is subsidized and you're paying low payments on what could be a large loan, you're minimizing the amount that's 
going towards the principal and then hence much more is going to be for, forgiven at the end. So, um, so that's the, that's the whole trick. The amount forgiven equals how much is, is about what you owed at medical school graduation. So PSLF is usually the best option if you qualify, but it's under a lot of risk. There's risk from legislation that, you know, the politicians are always saying, oh, you know, this PSLF program is, you know, unfair and, and all these doctors who make money are cashing in on it. And while there may be some merits to that, uh, it doesn't change the fact that it's under threat from legislation. And then also, what if you decide, hey, uh, you know, I don't want to work for this uh, medical school or for this VA or for this academic group, but rather, you know, this private practice is really where I want to work. And you've just kind of hosed yourself. So one way to hedge against that is to have a PSLF side fund. And so what you should do is take the payments that you would uh, put in or that you could afford otherwise, instead of putting them towards your student loans, put them into a savings account such that uh, and then invest it, you know, like into a, um, uh, into like a, uh, uh, similar to an IRA, but, you know, a, a um, uh, another mutual fund or something like that. And then what you can do is you can cash out on that money. If it's in, in a non-retirement savings account setting, you can cash out on that money if PSLF doesn't go through and you can put it towards the uh, loans. There are other options. So you could do student loan refinancing. It was impossible after the 2008 global financial crisis. It's possible again starting in 2013. Who knows if it's uh, what's going to happen with it? Um, you know, with the uncertainty with the years ahead after this uh, historic uh, pandemic. Um, but you know, the typical rates for an attendant of good financials, as you see, are listed. And they're pretty low. You could uh, typically get these once you have an attendant contract in hand. You have to qualify. Not all uh, docs are offered the same rates. You may not be offered uh, the same terms. It's highly dependent on your debt levels, your income levels, and your credit. And it's now possible to refinance uh, during fellowship. There are all these companies out there, Laurel Road and SoFi, Ernest. And refinancing uh, and training is possible by some of these um, companies. Uh, Pretty sure some of you guys have gotten mailers from these uh, companies probably on a routine basis. And they have plans where you pay a small nominal amount while you're in training. And so I would recommend that you refinance your private loans. Try to stick with a repay program for your federal loans, especially while you're in training. You know, do your comparison shopping. If you have a complex situation, sometimes there, there are people who have exorbitant amounts of money uh, from loans, private and, and uh, federal, and there are two physician households, and how can you ever get, that's when you should probably seek out the advice of a professional, um, a professional who has expertise in student loan management. Insurance. So, to start off the insurance uh, section, you know, I'm sure everybody's seen this. You go into Costco or Target or Walmart or whatever store you like, and, and you, you're going to buy yourself a TV. You worked for months to get this TV. Uh, you saved up a bit. Now you're going to drop down, you know, close to $1,000 or a little bit more, a little less based on the size of your TV. Uh, and you're going to bring it home. Well, when you go and check out, what do they do? They all say, hey, you know, do you want to, for like, you know, 20, 30 bucks, you could protect it against any kind of defect or fall or something like that. And a lot of people fall into that. And uh, I want to highlight how, well, if you're going to do it for your TV, there's probably something much more expensive and invaluable that you should do it for. So your career is an expensive product and an invaluable asset. If you lost your TV, you could still put food on the table, but if you lost your job uh, or your ability to get a job, that's you know devastating. So an attending urologist, according to Medscape uh, 2019 survey, makes uh, on, on average $400,000 a year. Now there's a cost of training, 13 plus years of training, college and medical school tuitions and fees, and then Include in that the lost revenue in, in your prime youth years. You know, you've 
you know, while your buddies from college were out making money, you were not earning money and spending it, uh, getting further training. And then there's the benefit of training. So if you're earning $400,000 a year, let's average that over uh, the average 30 year career, you're, you're talking about $12 million. And there are many hazards to this investment. Death is one of them. And while death doesn't affect you, it could affect those who re re rely upon you. Uh, disability, taxes, poor health choices. So, uh, you know, this is a resident wellness talk and poor health choices are important. If you are in the habit of eating two donuts a day and never working out, you are limiting your life. There is a higher possibility you're going to have obesity and then associated uh, metabolic syndrome and stroke and all this kind of stuff. We know this. Uh, so I would say eat better and, and work out, go out and run, uh, do whatever it is to improve your health, wear your seatbelt. That's an important thing too. Uh, other hazards to your investment are liability for malpractice. Uh, everybody will have malpractice insurance, so it is extremely rare to get an over limits claim uh, judged against you. That's very rare, but, uh, but it is uh, theoretically possible. And I, I guess it has happened in certain instances, but it's really rare. And then liability from life. Uh, if you drive a car, there's risk of accidents. If you have a business, there's risk of being sued because of the business. You own property, risk of being sued because someone slips and falls on your property. Uh, there's also divorce and speculation. Don't take your money and uh, put it into speculative stocks. So uh, again, thanks for answering the survey. It looks like uh, you guys are split. 50% of you guys have life insurance, 50% don't. And then when asked about disability insurance, uh, a minority ha uh, don't have, uh, well, I take that back, almost half as well, uh, don't have disability insurance. Uh, some of you are waiting for graduation. Some of you guys are not aware or interested. And then the rest have uh, individual disability insurance, either specialty specific or non-specialty specific. So a word on life insurance. It's a must buy if anybody else, or if anyone depends on your income. So I, I myself, I personally have uh, three children and a wife uh, who's currently a stay at home wife. And during this recent Corona pandemic, when I was going into work, everybody's anxious about Corona. You know, I, I recently had uh, life insurance um, uh, that was uh, enacted and while it doesn't really put me at ease, it does give me a little bit of comfort to know that if I go out and I do my duty and I'm working, I'm trying to be a good citizen, that if something were to happen to me, at least my, my wife and kids won't be sent to the poorhouse. So I think it gives you that, that uh, you know, assurance that you know, my wife isn't gonna be strapped for you know, all the payments and the responsibilities of raising my kids and all that kind of stuff. You should also consider it for a stay-at-home parent as well, but obviously at a much lower rate. And it pays a tax-free cash benefit upon your death. So um, you should buy term life insurance only. And uh, a lot of the uh, financial advisors out there will really push you to buy universal or whole life. Universal or whole life insurance pays the payout if you were to die, but also it has a small investment component. And that investment component goes into annuities and that supposedly bills cash value and that cash value you could borrow against it or take it out later on, or it could pay you uh, later on in life and supposedly pays for itself and all that. It's very expensive. It's literally eight to 20 times more expensive than term life. The, uh, the investments that they put it in are annuities, which are typically poor investments, and 75% of physicians regret, regret purchasing. And if you listen to any, any one of these uh, personal finance folks, they're really against um, uh, whole life insurance. Uh, I recommend two to five million for most docs. Uh, obviously, if you have kids, if you have mortgage, spousal income, federal loans are forgiven at death, that's something to remember. Disability and physicians and urologists. So, you know, 12 to 18% of Americans are currently disabled. Up to a third will have disability of at least 90 days. One eighth will have disability of at least five years. 
90% caused by illness. Dots have much higher rate of uh, musculoskeletal mental disabilities. I mean, as urologists, you know, we work with radiation, with lasers, heavy lead aprons, poor ergonomics, whether it be in the operating room or with the EMR typing all the time. Needle sticks, there's angry patients, angry spouses, angry coworkers, and now there's COVID. I mean, you know, we do have a lot uh, threatening us for our health. And that recent survey, um, that's it published in Urology Times. I think Stacy Loeb was behind this uh, survey. 90% of urologists work with some uh, work-related pain. So there's short-term disability insurance, which is your AFLAC, you know, pays the doctor's bills, right? Or pays you uh, when, you're, when you're out. That's 90 days or less. It's you, you usually have some coverage of this type uh, from the employer. And if you have an emergency fund, you don't need it because you already have that ability built in to live three to six months without, uh, without working. So uh, again, another plug for an emergency fund. Long-term disabilities for greater than 90 days. And it pays a monthly benefit if you become disabled beyond 90 days. The benefit is tax-free unless the premium is paid by your employer with pre-tax dollars. Um, you can generally insure up to 67% of your income. You need enough to cover your current spending plus your retirement savings. So there's two uh, big categories in uh, disability insurance. There's the individual and the group. Individual policies are much better, but they're much more expensive. So there's stronger definition of disability. The problem with disability insurance is there's all shades of gray uh, in disability, unlike life insurance, you know? Life insurance, you know, you're either gonna be dead or alive at the end of whatever event. But for disability, you know, can you walk? Can you use your hands? You know, can you flip burgers? Can you do your rotoscopy? Can you do your highly specialized robotic surgery? All those things are gradations on that scheme. And the individual policies will have stronger definition. It's portable. So if you leave your job, you take it with you. You don't lose that benefit after you leave your job. You have more options. And it's more difficult underwriting. You need a, an examination, a blood test, all this kind of stuff to get an individual policy. For group policies, it's a weaker definition. It's not portable usually. So it means it stays with the job that you're in. Um, you must take what's offered. It's cheaper and fewer pesky questions, no exam at all. There are a lot of riders that go with the insurance. So there's a residual or partial disability rider. That's a must have. COLA is the cost of living adjustment. You really need to have that in the first half of your career. Uh, future purchase off option, most residents should buy catastrophic uh, disability or long-term also disability. Uh, you know, I think the recommendations are to just consider buying a larger policy and then retirement uh, rider. It's only worth it if you cannot buy as large of a policy as you'd like. So you could try to trim some of the fat off of these um, uh, long-term disability insurances uh, by, you know, considering a little bit of an individual and a group policy or buy it from an independent agent. Look for discounts. If you're a, a woman, uh, look for unisex policies, although I think that's starting to go away, but I think there may be one group that still has unisex policies, so it's important to look for it because, unfortunately, um, you know, once you get pregnant, you're at a higher risk for disability and they, they use that against women, unfortunately. So I would say, um, try to get it before you also you get pregnant or you have a child. Cancel unneeded riders, consider graded premiums. And then if you finally become financially independent, you've been saving so much that now you don't even need to work because your money is making enough money for you to live. You don't need disability insurance because you don't have to work. Roth retirement accounts. All right. So Roth retirement accounts are pretty awesome and they're something that you really have to have. What benefits do they have specifically? One, it's asset protection. So uh, retirement savings accounts, also known as RISA, are usually protected from creditors. So, you know, you have a judgment against you, you have something against you. You know, most states will cover RISAs, a 401k and an IRA. You have to look at your individual state rule, but the vast majority cover uh, these RSAs from your creditors. It's good for estate planning. It's easy to designate beneficiaries and then there's a stretch IRA. 
there was an act that came out at the very end of 2019. I think it was called the SECURE Act. And now they've limited the stretch IRAs. That means if you pass away, you, um, your children inherit your IRA and they could take it out little by little over their actuarial life expectancy. But now the government has limited that to 10 uh, years of a time period over which they could extract that money. And that has uh, serious tax implications. So there are, you know, if, if you're at that level, you may need a financial advisor to help you uh, allocate which ones should be in Roth IRAs versus which ones should be in uh, pre-tax and all that kind of stuff. There's cheaper rebalancing, so there's no taxes due upon selling an asset. And it's better behavior. Penalties make it less likely that you'll raid the account inappropriately. It's much harder. There's a 10% penalty for you to go in there and take out plus the taxes that are owed. Um, so it's very difficult for you to go in and, you know, uh, I want to buy a new car, let me raid that 401k. It just doesn't happen. Um, but there's still ways around to get, uh, to get around it if you really had to. If you have lower taxes, you have higher returns. You know, there's a, something known as a tax drag on your investments. And if you have taxes nipping away and similar to fees, uh, if they nip away little by little on your investments, it really affects your investment growth over the long term. And so it's important that you have uh, retirement accounts that are tax advantageous um, for the long term. When you're a resident, your income is much lower. And because it's lower, you're in a lower tax bracket. And it is advisable for you then to put your money post-tax into a uh, retirement account at that point, like a Roth. So it's, it's tax-free at, at withdrawal because they've already taken out the taxes upon placement. That's unlike tax deferred, where it's like a 401k. If you put in pre-tax dollars, it grows. And then when you take it out, upon retirement, when you get your distributions, they'll tax you on that. And so uh, this is an, a golden opportunity while you're in residency to put money into a Roth uh, style IRA. The one caveat here is, remember the, um, the income-based repayment plans, they're based on your uh, disposable income. So if you're putting away pre-tax dollars, excuse me, if you're putting away pre-tax dollars, that decreases from the um, adjusted uh, income or the available income that they use to base your payments on. So if you're trying to lower your payments, it may make sense for you to put it into a 401k or, pre, or a tax deferred account as opposed to a tax-free account that you put in post-taxes. If you can, try to get an employer match. I, I don't know what the status is with residencies and uh, how they're doing with employer matches for retirement accounts. Uh, I don't even think um, we had that when I was there, but I think it's becoming more and more of an option. Have a written financial plan. The secret to physician wealth. So there's a difference, you know, and it's, not, it's sometimes not intuitive if you don't think about it. There's a difference between income and wealth. And so physicians are high income employees or high income, they have high incomes. But unless you start converting some of that income into savings, you don't have much wealth. And so you want to make a lot of money, don't spend a lot of it, put it into savings, uh, make your money work as hard as you do, don't lose your money to creditors, taxes, uh, death, disability, or speculation, and convert your high income into a high net worth. So the secret to physician wealth is live like a resident. And I'm sure you guys have heard this a lot. You know, when I was a medical student, they used to say live like a student now, live like an attending later. Um, but I think living like a resident or living well under your means, especially early on, and then always living under your means is a good way to uh, weather some of the storms that we're facing, uh, such as the, uh, you know, the current depression that we're in with Corona. So carve out a massive chunk of your income with which to build your wealth. You wanna pay off your loans, save up a down payment, max out retirement accounts, then enjoy the good life after two to five years. 
you want to look at the numbers. So average resident salary is $60,000, average attending salary two seventy five dollars for when you're just starting out. Taxes will take away $75,000, living expenses, you're still going to live like a resident, so $60,000, so you have $140,000 with which to build wealth. So you can pay off your loan, save up down payment, max out retirement accounts, and I mean, look at this. If you are able to save that much money per year, you, you could take care of $100,000 in loans in a year, $200,000 in a year and a half, $300,000, two and a half years, $400,000. Some unthinkable, ungodly number could be taken care of in three years just by living as a resident for those additional years. It's important that you have a written financial plan. The first attending year is the most important year of your financial life. Much easier to grow slowly into your attending income than cut back later. And, and that's so true. It's much harder to cut back on your quality of life than it is to grow into it. So try to hold back the reins, restrain yourself from buying that new fancy car or the big doctor house early on. Because if you do so, and then your house poor, car poor later on, and you have to cut back, that's really painful. Plan out what to do with your first 12 paychecks before you ever get them. Hit the ground running with a uh, plan. Contract evaluation. Be careful, you know, to this point, um, you know, until you graduate residency, you're kind of in a protected world, you know, that everything is pretty much fair and even for the most part, you, you know, you have big institutions, uh, they can't really screw you over individually. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, protections that you have as a resident, but when you go out into the real world, there's some funny things out there. You know, 50% of doctors change jobs in their first two, three years after residency because they had a toxic job. You know, I, I've heard stories from colleagues where they're rounding at multiple nursing homes and hospitals before they start office hours and a senior partner just sits back and doesn't do any of the work. Um, or they have, they're covering hospitals hundreds of miles apart. There are bad partners out there. Uh, and what happens if your career goals change? So. Uh, don't buy a house until you're in a stable uh, personal and professional situation. It is very difficult to relocate when you've purchased a home, and then especially so when you're hitting a uh, depression. Know what your contract says. So know your value. You can look at the MGMA uh, data. The Medscape data is free and probably a little less reliable. Um, there's also ACGME data that's out there. There are uh, books that are published by these groups uh, that publish this you may have to pay for it but if it results in a you know several thousand dollars uh increase in your salary well then that's uh you know two three hundred bucks that's well spent ask residents ahead of you for details consult salary surveys the best negotiating position is another job you know you need to have a batna best alternative to a negotiated agreement and i would say that you should never go into a job negotiation saying this it's only this job or that's it. You know, she had multiple job offers um, to try to leverage. One, it helps you compare, but then two, it helps you leverage your position uh, for a potential employer who may be interested. You need to have your healthcare contract, uh, sorry, your, your employment contract evaluated by a healthcare attorney in the same state as a job or a national contract evaluation service. Um, that, you know, I think Contract Diagnostics is a website that's out there. There's probably a couple others. I've heard good things about that one. Um, and it's important to review that because there's a lot of stuff that you don't know about contracts right now that you will need to have a good attorney review for you and vet out, or you will learn the hard way and you don't want to learn it the hard way. Money is fungible to most employers. That means it's exchangeable. So you can trade benefits you don't care about for benefits you do or for more salary, et cetera. Know what your contract says. How is your paycheck determined? What happens if you leave? How much notice do you need to have? Non-competes. What happens if you're fired? How much notice? Non-competes. Tail coverage woes. I mean, I've heard stories where there are people who, when they're fired, I think that's in some contracts that I have seen, uh, that if you're fired, they don't cover your tail coverage. So now you could end up uh, being responsible for a lot of insurance costs when you leave a job or when you're fired. Partnership details, all this is important. So it's important to, you know, you have a second job. You're the CFO of your family. 
Know your government loan programs and refinance when appropriate. Buy disability insurance. Uh, if you have anybody who depends on you, buy term life, not whole life. Get in the habit of saving. Use a Roth IRA while you, so a tax-free uh, when you're a resident and you're gonna use tax deferred later on. Live like a resident, hit the ground running, go into your job with your eyes open. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Osama. Um, that was an amazing talk and I, I certainly learned a ton. Um, we had a couple questions for you. Um, one's from Daniel Tenenbaum. Um, and he asked, is the money forgiven on PSLF uh, considered taxable income upon forgiveness at 10 years? No. He says he's heard conflicting reports. No, no, it's tax, it's tax free. So okay. it's a huge benefit. It's tax free uh, benefit, but it's under threat. So, you know, legislators are always saying, oh, this is something that we got to carve out. And now with all this uh, Corona stuff too, um, you know, I really would have a, a, you know, I'd hedge against it with a side fund if possible. Um, all right, let me see here. Uh, Dr. Badalato also had a question about um, attendings who are dependent upon um, um, or, or strategies in the wake of COVID for faculty who are dependent on a productivity-based salary scale. Um, and who will most likely sustain losses during the next fiscal year. Yeah, uh, it's a very real concern, you know. Uh, <laughs> if you're on a productivity-based model and patients are coming in because of corona, uh, you're, you're kind of hosed. So that's why it's important to live below your means, and that's why it's important to have an emergency fund, three to six months. I mean, that's critical. Um, and then one thing that maybe I didn't highlight in my talk is, I, I think personally, it's in everyone's advantage to strive for financial independence. You know, there's a whole movement out there of uh, financially independent retire early. If you're putting away enough money where you could retire by the age of 45 or 50 or 55, why not? Then you could work for free for fun. You don't mm -hmm. have to work to earn money to sustain a living. So live below your means, have an emergency fund and strive for financial independence. 